What do we remember in November of 2008? Was it this moment? Or this? This is an economy right now that can't find the bottom of bad news. 10 years of saving completely gone, vanished, a poof. Watching the Dow Industrial Average has been like watching the heart monitor on a critically ill patient. How do we understand this president and his time in office? Do we look at the day's headlines, or do we remember what we, as a country, have been through? The president-elect is here in Chicago, and he's named the members of the economic team, and they all fly in for the first big briefing on the economy. Many of the leading financial figures of the world are taking the subway in from the airport and traipsing through the snow to get to the transition office. There was a screen set up for slides, but we might as well have been showing a horror movie because what was described in that meeting was an economic crisis beyond anything anybody had imagined. You had people telling you that the auto industry was literally days from collapse. The financial sector, kind of the heart that pumps blood into the economy, was frozen up and in cardiac arrest. The six months surrounding January 2009 is the worst six months ever that we ever had in the data. It was the biggest crash of household wealth that we've ever had in the United States. Christy Romer, the incoming head of the Council of Economic Advisors, said, Mr. President, this will be as deep as anything we've experienced since the Great Depression, and millions of people are going to lose their jobs. Tim Geithner, the incoming Treasury Secretary, said the financial system's locked up, and Mr. President, it could collapse. And then Peter Orzag, the budget director, was the cleanup hitter and said this is going to add trillions of dollars to our debt. All I was thinking at that moment was, could we get a recount? Not since the days of Franklin Roosevelt had so much fallen on the shoulders of one president. And when he faced his country, who looked to him for answers, he would not dwell in blame or dreamy idealism. In our time of standing pat, of protecting narrow interests and putting off unpleasant decisions, that time has surely passed. Starting today, we must begin again the work of remaking America. As president, the tough decisions that he would make would not only determine the course of the nation, they'd reveal the character of the man. The first decision, where to begin? Which is one, which is two, which is three, which is four, which is five? Where do you start? What I love about the guy, he says, we're gonna do them all. Because we gotta do them all, we don't have a choice to pick. He acted quickly with the Recovery Act, giving help where it was most urgently needed. The country had been hemorrhaging jobs, more than 3.5 million lost in the six months before he took office. Middle-class jobs and economic security were vanishing. The funding would keep teachers in the classroom, cops on the street, and first responders ready. And for those who were hurting, small business incentives, tax cuts for the middle class, and job training. Building bridges, highways, and infrastructure. Laying the groundwork for a new economy and restoring the possibility of growth. But another immediate crisis confronted the president. Auto executives had asked for another bailout and there was pressure to act. Tonight, a top GM executive warned, without help, the company will default. There is no plan B. If the auto industry goes down, what happens to America's manufacturing base? What happens to jobs in America? What happens to the whole Midwest? If you closed all these car dealerships and you killed all these auto parts suppliers, people have no earthly idea what would have happened not only to the economy, but to our self-image. You know, a lot of conventional wisdom wanted to do what Mitt Romney did. Let it go. 
can't be saved. Why put good money after bad? Everybody, Democrats, Republicans. I mean, it was overwhelming. Look at the polling number. Do not rescue the automobile industry. The president faced a real risk either way he went. He fails to invest in the auto industry. It implodes. The economy goes further down. And blood is on his hands. The president invests and the auto industry just can't pull it out. That's on the president's hands as well. But he knew who it would hurt the most and how devastating the loss of a job can be to an entire family. My grandparents taught me that a job is about more than just a paycheck. They grew up during the Depression, so they'd tell me about seeing their fathers or their uncles losing jobs. Even if you've got a strong spirit, if you're out of work for a long time, it can wear you down. He decided to intervene. But in exchange for help, the president would demand action. The Bush administration had given the car companies $13 billion, and the money was now gone. He didn't just give the car companies the money, and he didn't give the UAW the money. He said, you guys got to work together and come up, and everybody's got to have some skin in the game here. You got to modernize the automobile industry. So don't bet against the American worker. Don't bet against the American people. We are coming back. Because of the tough choices the president made, the stage was set for a resurgent U.S. auto industry. And it wouldn't be the last time this president would face a crisis that others would rather avoid. One of the most worrisome problems facing Americans these days is the cost of health care and the rate at which it has increased. It had been an issue that both parties had struggled with for more than three generations. This is a huge economic issue because we spend 17.5% of our income on health care. No other big wealthy country spends more than 11.8%. And almost all of them have better results than we do. Health care costs had been rising three times the rate of inflation, crushing family budgets and choking business. And he knew that he couldn't fix the economy if he didn't fix health care. And he wanted to bring Washington together to share the tough decisions. But he faced a fierce opposition, hostile to compromise. It'll be a cold day in hell before he socializes my country. After months of negotiation, it was unclear whether he could get the necessary votes. Some advised him to settle. He could still claim victory if he accepted less. I regularly told him, look, you don't have to spell this much political blood. You won't get the health care accomplishment you're seeking, but you will have something. But he knew from experience the cost of waiting. When my mom got cancer, she wasn't a wealthy woman, and it pretty much drained all her resources. She developed ovarian cancer, never really had good, consistent insurance. That's a tough thing to deal with, watching your mother die of something that could have been prevented. I don't think he wants to see anyone go through that. And he remembered the millions of families like his who feel the pressure of rising costs and the fear of being denied or dropped from coverage. When you hear people saying that this isn't the right time, when you hear people more worried about the politics of it than what's right and what's wrong, I want you to think about the millions of people all across this country who are looking for some help. And when the votes were counted, that help would come. The bill is passed. Beyond the crises at home, among the toughest calls that he would make, he would make as commander in chief. He had promised to bring a responsible end to the war in Iraq and bring the troops home. It was a promise kept. After nine years in Iraq, all the troops are returning. Welcome 
Welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. And it was part of his broader plan to refocus our efforts on those that had attacked us. Intelligence reports locating Osama bin Laden were promising, but inconclusive. And there was internal debate as to what the president should do. We sat down in the Situation Room. The entire national security apparatus was in that room. The president turns to every principal in the room, every secretary, what do you recommend I do? And they say, well, 49% chance he's there, 51. It's a close call, Mr. President. As he walked out the room, it dawned on me, he's all alone. This is his decision. If he was wrong, his presidency was done. Over. Today, at my direction, the United States launched a targeted operation that killed Osama bin Laden, the leader of Al-Qaeda. A small team of Americans carried out the operation with extraordinary courage and capability. No Americans were harmed. They've been planning this operation for more than eight months, but in the end it came down to a period of just 40 minutes when it could either be a major success or a disastrous failure. A lot of people have asked, how did you feel when you first heard that it was bin Laden and he had been killed? And the truth is, I didn't have time for a lot of feelings at that point because our guys were still in that compound. And it wasn't until I knew that they were across the border, they were safe, everybody was accounted for, including the dog, uh, that uh, you know, I allowed some satisfaction. He took the harder and the more honorable path. When I saw what had happened, I thought to myself, I hope that's the call I would have made. It was the ultimate test of leadership. A victory for our nation. And there would be many others. His satisfaction not in Washington, but with the millions of families who would feel for the first time the security of coverage. 2.5 million young adults now have coverage. 17 million kids could no longer be denied for pre-existing conditions. He expanded drug discounts for seniors. And with the Patients' Bill of Rights, Americans no longer will see their coverage dropped or capped when illness strikes. He restored science to its rightful place. He announced historic new mileage standards that will reduce oil imports. And the country is now on track to double production from renewables. Raising expectations in our schools with higher standards in 46 states. He reformed the student loan system, shifting billions in subsidies from banks and middlemen to millions of young Americans. Cracking down on credit card companies and mortgage lenders so the American people would never have to bail out Wall Street again. And when Washington stalled, he would take action, protecting everyday Americans from predatory lenders. And I'm not going to stand by while a minority in the Senate puts party ideology ahead of the people that we were elected to serve. Not at this make or break moment for middle class Americans. They changed the way the world sees us. And brought fairness to soldiers who want to serve their country regardless of who they love. Thank you. Yes, we did. And a landmark law so that a woman who does the same job as a man can get the same pay. We will make sure that our daughters have the same rights, the same chances, the same freedoms to pursue their dreams as our sons. Judge Sotomayor, are you prepared to take the oath? I am. He placed two experienced jurists on the Supreme Court. And while the economic crisis proved to be more severe than experts had predicted, 
month by month, there was progress. Over 3.5 million private sector jobs in two years. And welcome news from Detroit. It is a banner day for the resurgent U.S. auto industry. Less than two years after coming out of bankruptcy, General Motors announced today it is investing $2 billion in 17 plants. With business booming, they repaid their loans. Tonight, General Motors is once again number one in sales worldwide. Time and time again, we would see rewards from tough decisions he had made. Not for quick political gain, but for long-term and enduring change. So when we remember this moment and consider this president, then and now, let's remember how far we've come and look forward to the work still to be done.